Welcome back to Podcast 72 of 2019. I'm your host, Kiev O'Neill. You can follow me on Twitter at OBKiev. Follow us at The Odds Breakers. You can follow us on social media as well, slash The Odds Breakers. This episode is being sponsored by MyBookie.ag. For a 50% bonus, sign up with MyBookie. You use the promo code the odds breakers terms and conditions apply if you'd like to help us out with our costs sponsor the podcast and the website we'd love to help you out please visit the oddsbreakers.com click shop and become a member for $17.99 a month you can get my plays and premium plays before the line moves for two dollars more you can have all that and become a patron subscriber get that in the podcast a little bit early and if nothing else please visit the oddsbreakers.com and become a free picks newsletter subscriber my friends we have a fantastic show for you today brian edwards from brian edwards and major wager is coming on to break down some of the huge games we have for college football championship week as well as the nfl and a little bit of you FC 245. So excited to talk to Brian about that. You know, first I wanted to talk a little bit about what we are. And I'm not just saying what the odds breakers is or what the podcast is. I'm just I want to talk a little bit about what you and me and our guests are kind of in general, right? So everybody has the same interests here. You know, if you listen to this podcast, you are like me. You do things that are similar to what I do to have fun, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. We have commonalities here. You know, it's in a way, we, we like to watch sports and we like to find value in watching sports, not just from what happens on the field, but also what happens in our pocketbooks and also about what happens about being right or wrong. A lot of people bet on sports to profit massively. They don't care about being right and that's completely fine. And, you know, some win, some lose. A lot of people bet on sports because they like being right more than the money itself, right? They just like the feeling of being correct on something. You know, maybe it's a little bit narcissistical, but at the same time, if you're going to spend so much time following sports, why not use that knowledge and make money off of it, you know, or being right about it? So for me, I think it's a, it's definitely a mix and it should be a mix for everybody. But I think for me, it's a little bit more about being correct about some something than actually the money and I think that's a smart way to do it because that way you're not beaten down if you take a couple bad losses and uh, you're not too high if you win and decide to bet more so that's uh you know that that's my two cents on how we really are we uh we like sports and we like betting and we'd be friends if we hung out I mean we are all essentially trying to break the odds we are all odds breakers all the listeners here are odds breakers we're odds breakers our guests are odds breakers you know we're all a tight community so um love sharing information if you have anything you can always tweet it at the odds breakers or hashtag it i know when this started years back it was something i wanted a little bit more of people you know just trying to share their thoughts and opinions and that hasn't grown as much as not nearly as much as the podcast has grown, but um, at the same time, that's something I still always want to hear about. I always like to look for information that I don't know. You know, sometimes people know about players and injuries a little bit more. I have people that reach out constantly on Twitter to me, you know, via the direct messages or sometimes just tweeting about what they know about their teams. 
I think that's awesome. You know, um, when I get direct messages, I don't share it because it's a it's a message. But always would love to hear information from you guys because you guys are the best. You guys are just like me, and we would definitely hang out if I ran into you. <laughs> so, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about our commonality here, and I think it's a great thing, and uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. And I'm very glad that sports betting is becoming legalized. Well, we have a huge show for you today, my friends. So we are going to jump right into it with our guest, Brian Edwards. And now I'm very excited to welcome back a longtime contributor to the Odds Breakers. You've heard him on many sports radio shows all over the nation. You can find some of his work at VegasInsider.com and MajorWager.com. I am very happy to welcome back Mr. Brian Edwards from Brian Edwards Sports. Dot com. You can follow him at Vegas B. Edwards. Brian, is the holidays treating you okay? Yeah, man, the valley's big. I need to get in the gym, but uh, <laughs> glad to be back on with you, Kiev. Hope you had a great holiday, and uh, Ray, talk some football, buddy. Yeah, my man. I think we finally got done with our sickness, my, my kids and uh, the whole family, really, and we're, get, we're getting past all that, and uh, we'll probably just get a new uh, influx of flu coming in any, any moment, but right now we're all healthy, so uh, I, I feel what you're saying about the gym. That thing, uh, the gym's getting dusty out there, I think, uh you know, you know, we all got to we all got to try to make it. I think January that thing will be packed, as you know. So, right, uh, you know, it might might not be a too bad of an idea to try to get a jump on that. But uh, either way, it's always fun because holiday season is time for football, my man. And uh, what a fantastic weekend we have of college football! Uh, lots of huge games, and uh, wanted to open up with a question, kind of general here. Uh, what do you th- who do you think should be uh, in the college football uh, top four rankings right now? And obviously, you know the, the committee has their own rules. Sports betters usually go by their power rankings. W- w- what are your thoughts on that? In what order? Well, uh, well, you know, I I don't think the committee should go by power rankings. In other words, I don't think that because you and I would make Alabama probably a double-digit favorite over Utah on a neutral field, that doesn't matter. Um, Utah, and and they have it in their verbiage. In fact, I looked it up uh, a couple weeks ago. Not only do they have in their verbiage, uh, talking about the committee, obviously, that conference championships are supposed to mean a lot, they also have, and I think this plays in Utah's favor, and and would have been in in Alabama's favor, or eh, Maybe not actually. With two, well, anyway, in Utah's favor, um, they are supposed to take into account injuries in the sense that, and I forget how they exactly verb- the verbalized it, but it, it's something to the effect, you know, if a team is missing a key player and they lose, but then he comes back and he's healthy and as is healthy like right now, like Utah Zach Moss is healthy right now and has proven he's very healthy. In other words, they, Utah lost its only game at USC. Moss got hurt in the first half, did not come back in, and that played a big role in that game. And so, and Utah is going to be a conference champion. Um, so, I think they have it right for now. But I think LSU is going to beat Georgia, and obviously, we'll get to that. And I think if Utah takes care of business against Oregon, I think um, you know, and F unless, and I hate to bring up a bad memory. But I know how Oklahoma, I mean Ohio State put it on Wisconsin 59 zip like five years ago. Um, unless Oklahoma or Baylor were to do something to that effect to each other, as long as Utah gets that W and LSU gets that W Saturday, I think we'll be looking at LSU, Clemson, Ohio State, and Utah, and that's what I think it should be. Now you can argue a little bit on who's got better. Uh, qual- or more quality wins out of Oklahoma and Utah, but the fact that Utah and, and Oklahoma was doing this earlier in the season, but not so much um, here recently, but Utah has won 10 of its 11 games by 18 points or more. Um, so they've just been more dominant. And so I think it's the committee is right for now. And I think when LSU beats Georgia and Utah beats Oregon, which I also think will happen, I think they'll have it right with Utah sneaking in ahead of the Baylor um, Oklahoma winner. 
Well, you don't have to apologize to me for reminding me about the 59-0 to shellacking Ohio State gave us because I hear it about 10 times a day on the radio the past, <laughs> the past five or six days. I mean, that's the scenario that always gets brought up. Trust me, it, it's like a dagger uh, <laughs> every time you hear it because it's your team. But, you know, being a Wisconsin fan, you root for chaos. You know, it's, it's because you're never quite there. And you always feel like you're getting screwed, even though you probably shouldn't be there anyway. You know, the basketball has been a bunch of Final Fours. Just couldn't get the W at the end for various reasons. You had your football team being in the top 15, top 10, top 8 a lot of times the last 10 years. I mean, us Badger fans, we root for chaos here. <laughs> we know, I mean, I'm looking for a situation where people are pissed off that there's not eight teams in the playoffs. So, you know, I want... Uh, I, of course, want Wisconsin to beat Ohio State as much as possible, even though that's very, very uh, unlikely. Uh, I'd like LSU to beat Georgia 6-3, to three, and I'd like Oregon to beat Utah 9-3, to three, and Baylor to beat Oklahoma, or Baylor to beat Oregon, uh, or sorry, Bay- Baylor to beat Oklahoma by a few points, Oregon winning by a few points as well. I think that'd be really interesting in the discussion there. Um, you know, I would wonder if Georgia beats LSU by two points or something like a field goal at the end and Utah just floors Oregon by like 30 points. I would wonder if, if that's enough to get Georgia, uh, get by Georgia for Utah. What do you think? Ooh, no, no. Uh, well, well, Georgia has, Georgia has had some. Uh, they don't have any style points the whole year. I, I thought you were going to put phrase that question. Utah get ahead of LSU, and I was I was going to say definitively not. But Georgia beating LSU and winning the SEC, I don't think that could happen either. I, I don't look. I don't think LSU, it really matters to LSU Ohio State in terms of being in the top four. I mean, I think they could both lose. I mean, as long as they don't get, again, 59 to nothing, uh, as well. I mean, I think they're both in. And, I mean, I don't know that Clemson would be in, but by the eye test, they should be in, even if they lose to Virginia. I mean, Virginia is 9-3. and three. Right. Um, you know, USC, uh, I would certainly, and I do have power rated ahead of Virginia, but remember, you know, Moss got hurt against USC, and that – you know, that was on the road. Um, so, anyhow, and Georgia's loss is at, yeah, Georgia's loss is at home to 4 and 8 South Carolina. That's interesting the way you put that, Kev, but uh, you I see, would you probably see, have to keep I think, go ahead, go ahead. I think that, I think if, if uh, Georgia barely beats LSU, LSU is still a higher seed, though, because Georgia oh, has yeah. that awful loss at home against South Carolina, you know. And, and looking how bad South Carolina was this year. I can almost compare them to Illinois. You know, Wisconsin's loss at and that was at least at Illinois. You know, and yeah. and, and remember, Halinski got hurt early second quarter, and they didn't score another point the rest of regulation until they got the field goal in double overtime. They were playing with a third string quarterback who had been playing wide receiver all year. Uh, from like early second quarter to the rest of that game against Georgia. Exactly, exactly. So how was that, you know? And, and you're right about style points. Another team that doesn't have a ton of style points is Oklahoma, and they had that stinker at Kansas State. You know, it's like uh, Kansas State's a good team, better than people thought coming in, that awesome new coach. But, you know, it's still a bad loss, you know. And uh, we'll see what happens. But, you know, I, I would wonder if – you know, if that scenario happens, I still think just because LSU beat Alabama, they won all their games, you know, they beat Texas, they beat everybody pretty well, that they still would be an inch ahead of Georgia. But then Utah sitting there like, well, dude, we lost to USC. They're a top 25 team now. You know, USC is having a beautiful finish. That would be that would that would be the chaos that us Badger fans are looking for, um, especially if we're not in, obviously. Um, you know, Ohio State, that that team is ridiculous looking, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But what are your thoughts on Alabama not making the playoffs and, and uh, you know, it being a number 12? I, I, I don't remember ever seeing since the committee and since the uh, uh, playoffs came in a few five, six years ago 
whatever it was, that Alabama's been that low? Well, you know, again, my power rankings are just based on if I had to take the bet and Kiev was coming at me with a stack of $100 bills, a big stack, and <laughs> who I'd make favorite over whom, and I have Al- – so I still have Alabama at number four. But like I said in that verbiage with the committee, they're supposed to take into account injuries. So to, to the committee, they look at Alabama right now minus – um, Tua, and look, I thought Mac Jones, obviously the two pick sixes were bad, but um, I was pretty impressed with Mac Jones the other day, all in all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, yeah, I thought, I, mean, I thought he played a hell of a game, to be honest. I mean, the two pick sixes aside, which obviously are huge plays, but, um, you know, uh, so whatever, it doesn't matter. Alabama ain't going to be in the top four, so... Uh, I didn't watch Fine Bomb today. I'm sure people were fussing that they were all the way to 12, but it's pretty irrelevant. <laughs> totally irrelevant. There's a lot of people all pissed off about where Florida is and where Auburn is. And, you know, and I was gonna... what's that? Is it Wisconsin sneak ahead of my Gators? Did I see that last night? <laughs> I think Wisconsin's got you by a little edge there. And, uh, there could be there could just be some. What is that eight nine yard eight? We're nine. <laughs> I know. There's your bowl game right there, right? So, um, you, you know, it's funny about that. It's it's just two ways to look at that. It, you know, Florida's got the win against Auburn at home. What other top twenty five wins do you have? Yeah, you have way better losses because Wisconsin had that stinker at Illinois, but at least our other loss was at Ohio State. How do you look at it? Is the losses more important because you lost to the number two and number four teams in the nation? Or is the wins more important because we beat Iowa, Michigan, and at Minnesota when they were ranked top ten? You know, it's a yin and yang pretty much. Which one do you want, right? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's that's that's all. Those are, you still got me stumped the way you presented that Utah question over Georgia because I had not ever even for a flipping millisecond even thought about that. But now that I think about it more, you I, that kind of is a, a that is up for some debate. But uh, yeah, Florida and Wisconsin. It don't matter. It's irrelevant. Yeah, it's um, it's irrelevant. It would be it'd be sweet to see a bowl game with those two teams. Um, now we will be favored in a bowl game if we do do <laughs> You know that, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's uh, if you go by ESPN's FPI, you would be, but uh, I think Sag. All right, then s- let's just do a pick them right now. If it happens, me and you, twenty bucks. Uh, all right, my all right, my man. You have a you have a deal right there. If that if if we're lucky enough to see that, uh, uh, we definitely have a deal. I think uh, I have Bama number five and Georgia number four. I have them really close to each other. It's just because Bama doesn't have two. If they had two, I'd have higher. Right. But you're right, Mac Jones really impressed me. But you know, I'm glad I stumped you on that because that just means how good of a weekend we have coming up here sure. for college football, my man. And let's get started right away here with. Uh, Oklahoma versus Baylor. The spread is around Baylor minus nine and a half. It's creeping down a little bit. The over under total is uh, 63 points ish. You know, when I wrote these down last night, they could have changed a little bit. So yeah, you, what are your thoughts on this matchup? My thoughts are that I just really don't trust Oklahoma right now, although they are off a very uh, solid performance. I mean, I know Spencer Sanders was, was out, but, look, Oklahoma just beat me last week. I had Oak State uh, plus the, uh, 13 and a half, 14, uh, whatever it closed at. And, um, obviously, that's the – look, anytime you go into Stillwater and win by 18, that's um, that's pretty solid. But, you know, their, their games before that, um, they had won those three games by only nine combined points and then the you know going back one more game was the loss at k-state so they were they had failed to cover in four in a row and were mired in a one and six against the spread slump but they get it done last week obviously baylor's got the revenge angle um but uh i just right now i just don't have a, a good feel for this one um and both of them are on a, a run of unders, but I don't – I just – they're both so explosive offensively, and, and, you know, we're indoors at Jerry World. Right now I'm on the sidelines for this one. Now, you know, if we were to get a line move 
uh, of significance, maybe that would change. But Kiev right now, um, you know, if I'm not com- – well, this is an early game. Yeah, if I'm not completely involved in other games, I might be looking at in-game situations. But right now this is a pass. You know, it's better to not have a play and tell everybody in many, in many cases. If, you know, I mean, a lot of people just tell them, look, it's – Spreads pretty close. I mean, unless unless this goes past the ten and below the seven, I don't see no value here. I think I made the game right around right. here. You know, so I I hundred percent agree with you. And and these teams, uh, you know, f- f- are they going to go over the total? Well, Oklahoma's super offense at eight point four yards per play. I mean, they could. You know, they average forty four points. But then again, Baylor's been really stepping on up on defense. And Baylor, not too long ago, was an overs team. I think two years ago when Matt Rule started, you know, they were hitting the overs. And now, you know, what are you going to do here? The thing about me, and I think uh, there's a couple games like this. The dog is favored a little bit when they're when they see each other the second time. You know, they learn a little bit about the team. Um, there's uh the the, t- the other team doesn't have to feel like they haven't seen them before, you know. It's kind of like oh, it's you again. Now it's my turn to win type thing. I I always uh kind of favor the dog the second time because they they they've played against them. They they went against those plays, you know. So when I look at this game, I have to lean towards Baylor down to seven points. It's not going to be a play of mine either. And I do have that Baylor ticket as we know. Um, probably gonna you know hedge it at some point here i'm still waiting on that spread to go down a little bit but uh baylor's trending up on defense you know a couple weeks back after the oklahoma lost and that was just a crushing loss at the end you know they shut down texas to 10 points and i thought that would be a bad spot for baylor and matt rule brought this team right back up to beat texas after that crushing loss against oklahoma and i lost that play then they go to kansas they blow them out by over 50 kansas can't even score what six seven points and uh, Kansas was an improved team on offense this year. You know, they put 48 up on Texas, and they've scored some points this year. You know, yards per play has Baylor, um, I think, a net two, and Oklahoma's a net three. So that, that puts Oklahoma at about a net one over them. But I, either way, I think the spread's a little too high here, but um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get involved because Oklahoma, they could get those style points that Lee, Lincoln Riley needs in this situation man any final thoughts no i'm just i'm kind of like with you between uh seven and a half and nine and a half no value and um but if it were to get to 10 i might maul baylor but uh right now nothing all right fair, fair enough my man well, let's go on a, another game a little bit more off the radar but i've been following appalachian state for a long time in the Sun Belt, and they've always impressed me and this year, they had that stinking hiccup again against Georgia Southern, but they took care of North Carolina, which is a, a above average ACC team. They beat South Carolina. You know they're kind of riding high. They they take two Power Five schools like that and win. And then uh, Louisiana Lafayette has been kind of a, a a better's dream this year. They've been kicking butt. I watched this game earlier this year, Brian, and uh, I know as- pass it out. I won. <laughs> Fortunate <laughs> you you won. Did, were you on the under or the side? I, no, I mean, I say a fortunate winner. I mean, App State was a short dog, but I mean, that game was one possession the whole way. They got a late touchdown to make it a seventeen uh, seven final. Uh, I, I could not say winner. It was the right side. No, I was on App State too, but I was worried. I was worried most of that game. Right, yeah, that's. A, I guess I just remember stressing for about four hours over it, but it was a W. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was a great game, and uh, I thought that Lafayette played great. And what's funny is you look at the numbers; they have a better uh, uh, yards per play advantage, net point three. You know, over Appalachian State. App State just lost one of their top pass catchers too, and Corey Sutton. I believe he has the most touchdowns catches for app state so i looked at that and i was like hmm that's interesting but then again app state's got a good home field here and this Sun Belt is played on a home field for their championship game here i want to be on louisiana um but i'm not sure if i can get to there i think the total is a little bit high at 56 did you make a play um well i have not made a play uh, yet, and in terms of the total, I, I have yet to go look at the weather, but I would imagine it's going to be extremely cold up in Boone 
um, this weekend. So, you know, App State, 11 and 1 straight up, 8 and 4 against the spread. You know, they haven't been a single digit favorite all year. Uh, you mentioned their three, um, well, they were dogs in those three wins, the two over uh, Power 5, UNC, and, and South Carolina, and then they were the short dog that night at UL Lafayette. But every other game, they've been a double-digit favorite. Um, in the uh, in the box score from that game earlier in the year, App State had a 343 to 254 advantage in total offense. But uh, I would imagine that was one of App State's lowest, if not the lowest, uh, yardage output on the year. But, you know, you mentioned um, – you mentioned Corey Sutton. Um, they didn't have any problems scoring points without him last week, uh, 48 at Troy. But, you know, he had been suspended the first two games, uh, yet was still having an outstanding season, 41 receptions, 601 yards, and seven touchdowns. And their tight end, Colin Reed, did not play against Troy last week. Uh, he's more of a, a quality blocker. I mean, he does have two touchdown catches this year. Um, but he was third team all Sun Belt last year. He, he's questionable, so that's a, just another little thing offensively that App State's dealing with. But yeah, you know Le- Levi Lewis, the QB for Lafayette, has been great this year. Twenty to four TDI and T ratio. Now they had to get ULM had to miss an extra point, and Lafayette, which you could say was in a look ahead spot, had to get a fifty two yard field goal with one twenty one left uh, last week to to prevail. Uh, over there in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, they've been dogs twice this year, uh, 2-0 and against the spread with one outright win. Um, I, you know, if Sutton was playing, I would almost certainly be on App State. Um, and I, I, I'd i probably say I lean App State at seven or fewer. Uh, but, you know, Billy Napier, and i also throw this out, um, and this goes for several games this week, but uh, Billy Napier's name – He's certainly in the hunt in the Ole Miss job. Now, what sort of distraction that'll be, um, I, I can't say. But, uh, you know, that could be a distraction for FAU as well and, and even more so for Memphis. And I, I'm sure we'll get to those games also. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, this number is pretty close to right, I think. To be honest with you, if you got past seven, I might even um, have a small play on Lafayette. I, I love the way they're running the ball, and I just remember how close that game was. I, I, the way I was looking at it is like, we're going to lose that play. So um, I don't know. I, I think the number's right on this, but I think the over is a little high because you look at it, you know, it was a 17-7 to 7 game. Um, and I think the last couple years, these were low scoring, if I remember right. Uh, 2018, we're looking at, yeah, 17 to 27. That's a pretty low scoring game. And the spreads at fit or the totals at 56. And if you look, um, a couple years back, oh, 17 was a high scoring game, but, uh, yeah, you know, uh, the defenses might step up. They might tighten up. We'll see what happens in this one. So, unfortunately, no big side on for me either, my man. But, uh, why don't we move into the next one here? Wisconsin. Well, uh, real quick, real quick, Kiev, just yeah. going to weather.com in Boone, North Carolina. Um, partly cloudy, minimal wind, no, precip- no precipitation, a high of 44 degrees. So it'll be cold, but nothing crazy uh, for the total in terms of Mother Nature. Yeah, that's true. That's almost almost high enough to be good football weather there. 45, this is yeah. a little chilly for these guys. They'll be fine there. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. No doubt. So nothing to make you lean towards the under. Um, no wind either. So, yeah, good good looking at that. Um, but let's move on to a bigger game. We have the Big Ten Championship game played at Lucas Oil Stadium. We have Ohio State and Wisconsin. Ohio State is laying minus 16 points here over under 56 and a half, man. Any thoughts on this one before I go on a giant rant? <laughs> um. It, I um, if I you know gun to head had to play it, I would probably go Ohio State of the over. But right now, um, I, I you know I'm not really sure if Fields is 100, percent and uh, so that gives me some pause back. And I don't like to eat a lot of chalk like this, uh, but Ohio State has just been obliterating everybody. Uh, you know, I love Wisconsin's defense. Well, Jonathan Taylor. Um, I just don't really trust your quarterback, so uh, I'll let I'll let you break down the analysis here, buddy. <laughs> well, 
I mean, it sucks because I expected Wisconsin to be in this game or Minnesota, as you know, but I didn't know Ohio State was going to be this good. This looks like Alabama's offense from last year and Clemson's defense from last year, you know. And when they went to Michigan, and Michigan was trending up last week, right? They they're kicking people's butts. You know, they're kicking they kicked Michigan State's ass by 30 some points, kicked Notre Dame's butt. You know, this was everyone's thinking this Michigan finally Michigan's back, you know? And the spread look ahead was 13 and a half and it went down to nine. Then I see some eights. You know, Ohio State's only favored by eight at Michigan. And what do they do? They freaking destroyed them, you know, uh, almost like that, almost like they don't even belong in the same conference. But I don't even, I'm not even sure if any team in the Big Ten, Pac-12, Big 12, uh, you know, ACC except Clemson belong in Ohio State's conference. It's almost like they're one above everybody else. I mean, they have the biggest yards per play difference. Wisconsin is a good one. They're 1. 1.8 yards per play, and that's almost a great one, actually. But Ohio State's is like 3.6. Something like that. They have a 1.6 yard per play advantage in this game itself. My number on this is exactly 16. It's exactly where the spread is here. But um, it, the fact that it's played at Lucas Oil Stadium is probably, you can look at it as being worse for Wisconsin. You know, I mean, this is a track where these 4.3. 40 speed athletes that Ohio State uh, recruits will be able to run on. You know, Wisconsin has a few athletes themselves here, but not nearly the count that Ohio State has, you know, as far as uh, four or five star athletes. Now, the thing is, like I said before, if the teams played each other before, I like to look towards the dog. You know, I bet you Wisconsin was nervous when they went there, but now it's the same guys that you already saw. Now, if we run Jordan, uh, Jonathan Taylor the uh, f- first half, like before, we're just going to get our asses kicked. That's the bottom line. But I did see some difference last week against Minnesota in that snowstorm. We were throwing over the top, you know, throwing over the top of that team, and we used a Jonathan Taylor um, in the second half more, you know, and he was catching passes. La- that Patriots Texans game reminds me of a possible way to beat them. You know, I-, I never see Bill O'Brien come up with a great game plan, but he stayed away from DeAndre Hopkins, went to his uh, tight end, and went to Duke Johnson. You know, uh, Fells the whole first half. The Patriots adjusted to them, and then he went to De- DeAndre Hopkins the second half, and they won the game. You know, that's the way. If you're going to have a chance against Ohio State, it's going to be. Play action, not handing the ball off to Jonathan Taylor because they can stop Jonathan Taylor and go over the top of those linebackers, sucker them in. An RPO would be great if they had one of those, but they did the last few weeks develop the Wildcat, and I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, um, Wild Goose going out there. Uh, Both teams are relatively healthy, but Wisconsin needs to get to Justin Fields, and they rank fifth in sacks. Of course, Ohio State ranks third in sacks out of the 130 teams. But, but Wisconsin ranks fifth, and uh, they did bang up Justin Fields a little bit last game. If they can get to Fields a little bit and actually throw the ball, just take the give the keys to Jack Cohn, let him do what he did against Minnesota, or at least let him try, I'm going to have no problem in that. If he throws a couple picks doing it, the hell, we tried, right? But if you're going to sit there and run the ball up the middle and think you're going to do anything for a defense that's going to stack the box, you just forget about that, you know? So um, coaching-wise... I, I think Paul Chris might know that, but at the same time, Ohio State's the best team that I've possibly ever seen. So um, I didn't make a play on this, but I will tell you this: being at Lucas Oil Stadium, fifty-six and a half points might be a little bit too low because I could see Ohio State scoring forty-five themselves. You know, um, I could see Wisconsin scoring a little bit here, and you uh, know the fact that they're going to be throwing the ball more. I think. I think the total's a little low, so I would lean towards the over. Have you looked at this game? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have, but I just um, – I've, I've got some other plays. I, this, one's one I'm, uh, this one's one I'm on the sidelines for. No, no, and, and most people are. Obviously, that spread went from, what, 16.5 to 16. It's not like it moved. So I think people are waiting for something. They're waiting for 17, 17.5, 17 and some people might be waiting to hope they get a 14, right? I think uh, the thing's just kind of sitting, sitting there dead. 
Um, eventually, Friday, Saturday, you're going to start seeing some more action. So never never a problem to wait it out because so what if you don't make a play? It's better to not make the wrong play. Just wait for your number. Well, you can always live bet it as well. So that's kind of what I say. But, uh, yeah, I see some points being scored in the dome in the warmth here. And so I'm going to go with a small play. Uh, most likely on the over, nothing official yet, but that's what I'm looking at, my man. Well, this game, I think you know a little bit more about being in SEC country, Brian. Big game here. Interesting not seeing the name Alabama or Auburn, but we have Georgia versus LSU. LSU is now up to seven points. The over-under is about 50 for my man. What's your thoughts about this, baby? Uh, LSU's in the playoffs right now. Georgia's got a win to get in. Yeah, I, this is my favorite play of the week. Um, I jumped on LSU uh, minus six and a half Sunday. Um, I think you're fortunate to get it at seven or fewer. Um, you know, Georgia, the word out of Georgia's camp is that DeAndre Swift is fine and he's probable, but he did leave that game with a shoulder injury. And never came back. And, and then most important, you know, Lawrence – first off, Georgia's wide receivers is their least experienced and uh, thinnest position depth-wise all season regardless. And now Lawrence Cager uh, sprained his ankle at practice last Wednesday, and he is out. Uh, he had 33 catches for 476 yards and four touchdowns. And then the freshman Pickens – gets in the fight and gets ejected against Georgia Tech. So he has to sit out the first half, and he has 33 receptions for 498 yards and six touchdowns. So there's uh, Brahms' two favorite targets in a passing game that has struggled all year long, um, other than, you know, from not making mistakes. I mean, he, unless he – I don't know if I even looked at the box score against Tech, but unless he threw an interception against Tech, the only interceptions he's thrown all year with a three that he threw to the same guy against South Carolina. Um, I think LSU wins by two touchdowns. I think this is the play of the week. Um, and I think if you can still get it at seven, you get it now. Cause I won't be surprised if it's eight, eight and a half later in the week. Um, you know, Joe Burrow, uh, 4,366 passing yards, 44 to six TDI and T ratio. He is in nothing short of sensational I don't think he'll be denied this Saturday you know barring injuries going in the playoffs I don't think he's going to be denied against anybody that's pretty much been my thinking for about six to eight weeks and you know again barring injuries I don't see it changing I think LSU covers this week and I think they're gonna win it all win it all wow <laughs> you're already uh on the LSU train over Ohio State it looks like that's interesting um been on that train, Kia. <laughs> it's hard to argue um, what you're saying about LSU. Joe Burrow has definitely uh, got his Heisman ready for him. All pro- it's probably already made. The trophy's got his name on it and everything. You know, I don't see, I don't see uh, that being an issue. This game's in Atlanta, right? Um, the Mercedes Benz. It, it is. It is. And I think that LSU fans are in a, a mode of saving money for the trips to the semifinals and finals. So um, normally I would say LSU having such a big year, it might only be 60-40 or 65-35 Georgia fans. But with all the corporate seating, which goes to businesses in Atlanta, which is you know quite a few UGA alums, uh, this will be a pretty – healthy home crowd advantage for Georgia, probably in the 70, 30, 75, 25 range. But um, I don't care. Joe Burrow did just just, did just fine at Brian Denny in front of 100,000 plus uh, enemies. Uh-huh. So it doesn't matter to me. You know, it's hard, it, it's hard to go by power ratings. LSU can, you know, turn it up. It, they might be just one of those teams that you don't never rate high enough because they're always winning by the fourth quarter and they you know slow it down a little bit. I my power rings has five point five right, but uh, I am concerned about the home field uh, in Georgia. There, they, they, I'm concerned that it's win or win or lose. They're out. Kirby Smart's not the greatest coach as me and you talked about before, but one thing he does have is um, the experience in this position. 
God, LSU, they have so much momentum. They're like a freight train going through people, you know. And they're going to be motivated to win the SEC championship. You know that. You know, they they want to do that. So I, I am definitely concerned. <laughs> I, I give Georgia the head coaching advantage, but the, the thing I'll give Orgeron credit for is, is he lets his guys coach, and he, he lets Dave Aranda run the defense, and he lets uh, Enfinger and, uh, and Joe Brady – do their thing on offense and so uh from a coordinator standpoint i think lsu has a substantial edge coaching wise and so i think if you just overall are evaluating the coaching i say edge lsu although the specific head to head coaching matchup uh head coaching coach o and kirby i i give to kirby but you know last time he was here he made one of the more knucklehead fake punt decisions I've ever seen. So, um, <laughs> yeah. but, I, but again, I mean, I'm not like this, is, this to me is not a close handicap. I, I, I think LSU wins this game by at least two touchdowns. All mm-hmm. right. Well, there you go. It's a best bet from Brian Edwards right there on LSU. We'll see if they can stop Deandre Swift in the run there. And, uh, we we'll see if they can stop Georgia from making the playoffs. You know, to be honest with you, my heart wants LSU to win because, uh, Georgia's been in the playoffs too much lately. You know, <laughs> you got to understand we, people are looking for some new blood being in that it's four teams, my man. Well, any quick games you want to talk about before we just touch on the NFL? Uh, yeah, I, I like Utah, but I mean, we've kind of covered that, you know, uh, you know, Zach Moss having a great year. Tyler Huntley, uh, 16 to 2 TD INT ratio, five touchdowns. Like I said, they've won 10 of their 11 games by 18 or more. They're third in the nation in scoring defense. They only give up 11.3 points per game. They're number one in the country against run defense. Um, I've all, I've been saying for two years, Herbert is very overrated and I'm, I'm appalled at the fact that some people mention him as a potential number one pick. I don't think he's a first round pick. Utah's covered eight in a row. I think they win by double digits as well. And then here, I'll throw out my two other picks. Um, I'm going to go with FAU minus seven and a half to UAB. Buy that hook is the key number of seven if you can. Uh, now, if your number is eight and you got to pay like minus 135, minus 140, don't, don't do that. But if you can go from seven and a half to seven and a minus 20 price, do it. You're not going to need it, though. I, I, God, I'm, I'm eating a lot of chalk here. Actually, I've got one of the players that, that is a dog. But um, FAU's won five in a row, all by double-digit margins, since they dropped that heartbreaker to Marshall. Um, they're 4-1 and one against the spread during that span. Um, UAB's quarterback, Tyler Johnson, is not very good, but he's questionable anyway. Uh, the only team of note UAB beat all year was La Tech, and they beat La Tech when Jamar Smith, their star QB, and their star wide receiver were out with a suspension. So I, I'm big on FAU. And then my other play is I like Cincy plus nine and a half. It looks like they're going to have Desmond Ritter back, but they covered, um, granted it was a little higher than this uh, at around 13, or it shot up to 13, 14 when it got out that Ritter wasn't going to play last week. But Ritter had not been playing well anyway. He had that shoulder injury. Um, they held him less than 100 yards passing in two games before. So if he goes, great. But if not, I mean, Ben Bryant, he threw the two picks last week. But other than that, I thought, you know, he played pretty well. Um, and that was his first career start, and it was on the road. Now he's got to go back to the same venue. I think he'll be much more comfortable if he goes. But Ritter, um, Fickle said yesterday Ritter's going to start. Um, Michael Warren ran the ball well against them last week. You know, Memphis strength is not their defense. And, um, you know, I'm not, quote, unquote, reporting this or anything. But I'll definitely predict that uh, by Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, Mike Norvell is going to be the new head coach at Florida State. And um, that um, I know that is about a – barring last-minute snags, that's about a 95%. And I think the rumors of that will get stronger closer to kick. Now, look, Luke Fickle might be in play at Missouri or, or, or potentially a couple of other jobs too. So they might be dealing with that a little bit as well, and it might be a wash. But I'm, I'm telling you, neither one of those things have anything to do with my handicap. I like Cincy catching the big numbers. Your number's nine and a half by the half point to ten. That is what they lost by last week. But, you know, that game was pretty much 
I know Memphis jumped out to the 14 nothing lead, but that, that game was nip and tuck, tuck, one possession game uh, the majority of the way. And um, I like the Bearcats catching the number. All right, all right, my man. Well, hopefully the Bearcats come through because I'm definitely leaning that side as well. And, uh, you know, as, as some people remember, we do have them 7-1 to one to win the American Athletic Conference. So really hoping that happens. And uh, it, it, the spread does seem really big to me. And this is another situation where last week Memphis – did uh they had everything to gain by winning this game and Cincinnati had no motivation whatsoever um to have to win this game maybe maybe a new year's six bowl i don't know but probably not you know i think the the winning the conference is more important so they got some information on memphis now and uh i, I agree with you whether ritter plays or not the backup's pretty good there so i love the plays man fantastic and that florida atlantic that seven and a half is telling you something man Especially at this point, and remember that game's in Boca. That that's a legit home game for FAU. Absolutely, I say get that. So I don't even know if we'll go to seven. This thing could go to ten. And UAB, they're fake news, man. They I, I faded them against Tennessee because they had the easiest schedule out of all of college football. Uh, there's FCS teams that has much harder schedule than them, and uh, when, when Tennessee threw the ball right over them, and I think Florida and Atlantic is going to do the same. So fantastic play on that one. Very much love it, my man. Well, let's quickly. I know we're, we're kind of getting short on time here. Let's let's run through the NFL real quick. Uh, Baltimore versus Buffalo. Buffalo's about. Uh, plus six now over under is 43 and a half. Anything on that one? Well, I, I had Buffalo, uh, last week against the cow, the Cowgirls, And, uh, that was quite successful. Um, they've won three games in a row, uh, straight up and against the spread by double digit margins. Um, they had that heartbreaker, uh, at Cleveland, but that was a push, and then they covered the game before that, so they're 4-0-1 against the spread their last five. And I remember the stat last week. They, I, Hold on, I'm looking at it right now. They're two, three. They're 4 and one against the spread as underdogs, and I'm pretty sure that's four outright wins. Um, no, I'm sorry, three outright wins. But, uh, you know, Bills are perfect. And, I mean, you know, to beat the Ravens and Lamar Jackson, you got to have a great D. And the Bills are, uh, you know, ranked in the top three or four in pretty much every defensive category. So, as much as I, you know, hate to fade uh, Lamar Jackson in Baltimore, um, I lean Buffalo there. But I have not. I have not like officially made any NFL bets or even posted any in, on my picks site just because Wednesday, you know, being a, just a little early. But I lean Buffalo there. No, I agree with you. My power rings have it at three point five. This game should be about a three and a half point favorite. Now, I guess you know they the Ravens have that high power offense and they do play a lot of a plays. They play fast and then when they're done blowing out the team, they play it a little bit slower towards the end. You know, in my opinion, um, I, I haven't seen a total with Lamar Jackson under 44 in a long time. And Buffalo has had one of the easiest schedules. No, no, Kiev. I haven't looked at it, but, you know, Orchard Park this time of year. What's that? I, I'm sorry. Never know. I, I haven't looked at the weather, but I, when you brought up the total, I was just I, like, better look up the weather because Orchard I, Park in I, December. I did. I did. And and okay. it's, it's going to be a little windy, but not nothing terrible. And it's going to, and it, it's not supposed to be uh, uh rainy or any precipitation. So uh, I did look at that, but uh, I, I'm just saying that that total looks a little bit low to me, but uh, you know, from a power rating standpoint, you know, I have it at three and a half and this thing is six, but here's the thing about this. This is going to go higher. Everyone's been, been betting Baltimore, and you know on Sunday they're going to be like, oh, Lamar Jackson, oh, Lamar Jackson. You know, it, it's going to go up to seven, and that's my opinion, and I think it's going to happen. And I think if you're going to like the uh, side of the Buffalo Bills, you wait on that sucker, man. I think you're going to get a better number on it, and uh, obviously we have to get this podcast out early, and that's why you know we haven't made all, all of our NFL plays. So uh, I, I think if you like Baltimore – then um, you want to take them at six, you know. But in my opinion, I, I think this number is too high as well. So looking at that one, next game, look at San Francisco, man. 
They go to Baltimore and they have a coin flip type game, lose by a field goal at the very end. And now they got to go to the Aints, as you like to call them, Brian. And uh, the spread is minus two and a half here. Over under is 44. I think I have uh, San Francisco better in my power ratings than New Orleans. What about you? Um, I, about the same. Now, New Orleans got some extra rest having played Thanksgiving night. Do you know if San Fran, did they stay east this week? They did, I, I don't yes. Know. Yes, they did. Okay. They did, and I did like you know, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like that better than doing all the travel, but then again, you're cooped up in a hotel, so you never know how that works. I mean, I, I think I would rather my 6'6", 320-pound guys not have to be on long flights twice in two weeks. So I, I do prefer that for the Niners. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, my Falcons show the, show the Saints what they need to work on. For those that were still watching, um, they need to work on their onside kick defense. <laughs> That's for sure. I don't know if you saw the Falcons. <laughs> oh, my God. In a row I, I hit my teaser because of that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hell, yeah, I bro, saw that. <laughs> bro, I had – I had Falcons, uh, one of my accounts had, had moved it to eight, and I had gotten Saints at six early in the week, so it allowed me to push on my, one side of my head, so I appreciated it, and I was just glad to scare the life out of the Saints um, in this dismal season for my Falcons. I, I'll gladly take the split and then a little bit of slight scare on the game we lost to them. Uh, well, one more thing about this, and obviously you haven't played it, but San Fran they have kind of a monster 0.8 net yards per play against the Saints. And Saints fans can say, oh, well, Drew Brees wasn't playing. Teddy Bridgewater played fantastic when he was with them. Didn't even lose a game, I don't think. Was it against, no, five and up. against the spread, darling? I'm not making any excuses for that. You know, Drew Brees is getting older here. I think... <laughs> I, I'm leaning San Francisco on this side here, especially with looking at that yards per play. And when they they also stayed overnight when they played that Tampa beginning of the year, I believe it was they stayed on the East Coast and then went to Cincinnati and destroyed them. So uh, they're used to that already. So uh, I'm I'm moving towards the San Fran side. And uh, is there a lean for you on that? No, not really. Um, I just. Uh... Uh, nah, I don't have an opinion on it right now. I probably won't, actually. What about your Atlanta Falcons here hosting the Carolina Panthers? Lots of crazy things with this matchup here. Over-under is at 40 and a half. You know, Coach Ron Rivera being fired yesterday. And I got to tell you, I'm shocked it took this long. Not that because Rivera is a bad coach. I just think that NFL teams move on quicker. Personally, I think Cam was the problem more than... Rivera and Rivera kind of had to stick with him. Once Cam's the threat of Cam's legs went away, he had to be a great cor- pocket quarterback, and that didn't happen. And you look at his completion percentage the last two years; it's pretty bad. So, um, a very interesting handicap with Rivera being fired. I usually like you. I, I usually like to be on the team that fired their coach that very next week. Man, <sighs> what are your thoughts on this one? Well, it's just one you can't really handicap to you know about Julio Jones. Uh, he's a question mark. The Falcons might get Austin Hooper back. Um, that's good. And then you just it's just so hard to tell whether a, uh, a team is going to play inspired for the interim coach or whether, they, or whether they're just going to mail it in because they know they don't have an answer to anybody. So, um, you know, if, if we were if this was Sunday morning and I knew Hooper and Jones were going to play and it was two and a half, I, I would probably lean Falcons. But my, you, my Falcons are so unpredictable right now, so I definitely don't have an opinion at this point. You know, Carolina might have the worst run defense now that uh, Poe's been out, and two other guys are highly questionable. You saw D- uh, Geis uh, throw people around last week. Uh, the Redskins just bawling right through their defensive line, man. That worries me, but can I trust Dan Quinn to run the ball? And, and do the right thing? I, that's a great question there. But I do know that both defenses give up six yards per play and 27 points per game. So being in the in the dome there, I kind of like the over. We'll wait a little bit on that and wait for Julio. I think that's not a bad idea there, buddy. Uh, last NFL game real quick. The uh, 
Kansas City Chiefs at the New England Patriots. New England is laying minus three over under 48 and a half. Have you uh, got a chance to quick look at it? <laughs> I got enough of the Patriots on Sunday night, buddy, uh, for a big fat L that I did not need at all. So, um, man, they're struggling offensively really, really bad. Now, I'm not going to be that one to overreact and, and you know, and imply that Brady and Belichick won't get it fixed. But um, it seems like Kansas City is starting to play a little better, you know, in October and, you know, early November. You couldn't really trust them to stop anybody or to be able to run the ball effectively. But um, they're playing better here the last couple of weeks. So, uh, I mean, I just I, – I just – I can't. Uh, New England lost me so much damn money Sunday night. I, I can't. Uh, I can't get behind them this week. I mean, I would have to. It's hard to lean anybody against New England in Foxborough in December um, with, at this short a number. But um, if I had to pick it right now, I'd probably go Chiefs. It was crazy to see Bill O'Brien uh, kind of out coach Bill Belichick that game. Um, I agree. I st- I'm glad I stayed away from it, but I did lose on the over on that late touchdown to White, so that pissed me off. You know, both teams positive point six yards per play. That's kind of, that's actually exactly equal right there. You know, y- you first look at it at 48 and a half, you're like, oh my god, I got to take the over here. But if you want to, th- I have to think Belichickian. You know, what would he do? You know, he he's going to look at KC and they have they're the worst team against the run. Well, top three, I think, worst against the run, right? So if the Patriots can get the game going, they can at least control the clock and limit the possessions that Mahomes has. You know, and, and that usually obviously fa- uh, favors the under. You know, in Kansas City's front four, they're battered up. Clark is questionable to play. So if you're Bill Belichick, you're going to try to just pound the ball the whole time. You don't want Patrick Mahomes to have the ball. You know, so so that kind of tells me under a little bit. But it's hard to do that. It's hard to bet the under in a Kansas City game. The big problem for the Pats, they only average 3.5 yards per play, or yards per rush, I mean. And that's one of the lowest. I think that's the bottom three right next to the Chicago Bears right there. You know, fourth worst in the NFL, actually, I just saw. So uh, 3.5 yards per rush is just not good. The Patriots also lost two fullbacks this year to injury, and that helps the running game. I think that's why their yards per rush is uh, low and their offensive line is beat up. It's a stay away from me. Any last thoughts on that one? No. I, yeah, just if I had to pick it, probably Chiefs, but um, not, not, not a strong feel at all. All right, my man. Well, any other quick games before we take a look at UFC 245? Um, no, no, and um, I'll just go ahead and jump right in on that that UFC uh, card, which is an absolute monster uh, next week. Um, first off, if you do parlays, now I don't ever recommend eating a big chalk, but if you do parlays and don't mind a, a couple of favorites, I would put Matt Brown uh, in a parlay. He's minus 350, too, too straight, I mean, uh, too expensive on the straight price. Um, I worry about Platinum Perry's nose, which got really messed up uh, when he fought last, like seven or eight months ago. Uh, he had surgery. It looks better now. But, uh, you know, Rory McDonald had a similar injury against Robbie Lawler, and, and he was not the same fighter for several years. But nevertheless, Platinum Perry at plus 215 with his knockout power, um, I, I, you know, I, I lean him for just a little small nibble. Um, I like Ian Heinish to bounce back. He's off his first UFC loss. Uh, he's only a minus 135 favorite. Um, Volkanovski and Holloway is a pass for me um, unless it gets cheaper. If, if Holloway were to get to less than minus 150, I would be okay with him. But, man, Volkanovski scares me. He's one tough son of a gun. And back to, uh, you know, if you're doing a parlay, um, Amanda Nunez is, is too expensive to bet on the straight price, um, but she's going to win. So that's another minus three hundred favorite to put in a parlay with Matt Brown. She's fighting. Um, a, she's fighting a girl that looks like Vin Diesel over here. What's her name? Yeah, Jermaine Jermaine, Jermaine Durand to me, uh, who is an outstanding fighter. But look, Amanda Nunez is Amanda flipping Nunez, and she is the baddest female on the planet of all time. And if you can get a, a prop for her to win by KO um, that, you know, is maybe 
not too – I mean, gosh, it probably – that will probably still be like minus 200. So that would probably be a little too much. But uh, Nunez to win by knockout, if you can get that at like minus 150 or less, see, the, those props aren't out yet and probably won't be until Friday night or early Saturday. Um, Nunez is going to win and she's going to finish her. Um, so – and then the other one um, – I know it's his debut at 135, but the former 145 longtime champion, Jose Aldo, uh, is going down to 135, and he's a plus 160 dog. You know, when somebody's dropping weight, and look, Aldo's at times had trouble dropping weight to 145. So wait and see how he looks and if he makes weight, cause, and that's Friday morning, obviously. But if he makes weight and doesn't look too worse for the wear, um, I like Aldo at plus 150 or better. And then Uriah Faber is a plus 400 dog. And the way he looked last time out in his comeback fight, winning by first-round KO, uh, he's worth a small nibble against Peter Yan, who, who is a badass for sure. But, um, again, just small change with these big underdogs. So uh, if Faber's plus 400, I'll get a small taste of him. And the, the main events have passed for me. Uh, Covington and Usman are just going to wrestle and grapple. It'll be boring, but um, and I have no idea what will happen. So it's passed for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the main event sometimes a, a pass, and uh, some big boys there. Well, was a, that's a welterweight, actually, main event, right? Yeah, Covington right there, 15-1. Yeah. and one. Usman is 15-1, and one, both equal. Um, yeah, all, you know, all the dropping weight, and he's going to be a dog there? Hmm, you know, you know that, that's 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 not a bad idea looking at that one. I, I definitely uh, like what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and Edgar, um, Edgar's done the same. He's booked for his first fight at 135 as well. It's very rare for these guys in their mid to late 30s. When they change weight, they usually go up. Instead, these guys are going down, and uh, you know we'll, we'll just have to see how they react to that kind of weight cut. Now, for Edgar, you know he used to fight at 155 and not drop weight, and barely had to drop weight to get to 145. So I don't, I don't think now Edgar's fight is not for several weeks. But um, I don't really worry about Edgar. But but although I just. I mean, I remember seeing him getting on the scale to get to 145 and, and looking like he'd been through hell the last 72 hours. So um, I really want to see him, what he looks like at 135, and, and, and you know, is he is he limping to the scale or is he getting right. there fine? We'll, we'll see. Exactly. There's a right way to cut weight, which is takes a few you know weeks, and then there's the wrong way to do it to have to dehydrate the hell out of yourself before the fight, right? So, right. Uh, anybody that's been in wrestling knows a little bit more about that. But uh, Amanda Nunez, my girl, I've been, I've been on her way before she was the uh, champion there, so I'll, I'll definitely be going for her. But uh, you know, Vin Diesel looks pretty mean over there, so. Uh, uh, we'll see. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see how your jaw works over there. It's uh, not a beauty contest in that <laughs> that one. I tell you that. <laughs> That's for sure, my man. Well, sorry for going over time, Brian, but I really appreciate you coming on talking about that. You gave us some great plays for this weekend, my man. I'll be tweeting at you for sure. Uh, have a blast uh, watching these games, betting on them. And make sure you guys check him out at MajorWager.com. You have some fantastic articles. I really appreciate it, Brian. Thanks a bunch for having me, Kiev. And um, uh, my Twitter that you gave out earlier is at Vegas B. Edwards. And if you want to follow the Major Wager Twitter as well, um, and it's at Major Wager Uno, U-N-O. Thanks a bunch for having me. Kev, always fun, and uh, good luck to your Badgers this weekend, and I'll talk to you soon, brother. All right, my man. Talk to you soon. Well, that was fun, but it was a little bit rushed because, to be honest with you, we started a little bit late and had to get to some appointments afterwards. But this next segment, I will give you the College Football Championship Week free plays as well as NFL coming up with the Sharp Line Movement. Let's start right out with Virginia versus Clemson. Clemson is laying a normal Clemson 28 and a half over under 54.5 ish. Some 55s out there. Clemson, you know, they show that they're the best defense on paper right now in college football, right? But, you know, they also had 
pretty much the easiest schedule out of any of the top 25 teams. I mean, they kind of got lucky this year as they Texas A&M, not that good. Obviously, no top 30, top 40 wins. That was their hardest game, I think. South Carolina was extremely injured when they played them. And they avoided the next best two teams in the ACC in Virginia in Virginia Tech. Okay? They didn't even have to play Pittsburgh. When they played North Carolina, it was pretty close. Not taking anything away from Clemson. They're the champs. They deserve to be here. But, you know, Virginia, they're a little bit overrated in one point of the year when Bryce Perkins was playing bad, but that's because he was injured. And when he ended up getting better and back to normal, their last six games, they averaged 39 points per game the last six. Okay? So I think they should be able at least hang 20 points here in a losing effort against Clemson. I think they're going to hang 20. You know, that's kind of my number. Plus, Clemson's not going to, you know, obviously keep their starting defense in at the very end of the game. You can see some garbage if that happens, if they're winning by 20, 25 points here. But uh, on the other side of the coin, you know, Clemson averages themselves 45 points per game. And that's just on average. When you look at Virginia's defense, it's very average, you know kind of just giving up a 5.5-ish yards per play, 20-some points a game. It's just very average. So um, Clemson's going to put up whatever they want to put up, and it's usually in the 40s uh, or sometimes even the 50s if they can get some turnovers there. So uh, I see this game being around 44-21, to 21, and this marks a play for Virginia here at the plus 28 and a half over that, you know, key number of 28. It's not that key when you get that high, but still four touchdowns. But more importantly, I like the over 54 and a half or 55 here, whatever number you can get. I think, uh, you know, just for the fact that Clemson can hang some big numbers and they might be motivated to um, if they think they can get a number one spot in the college football rankings because the number one spot plays the number four team, which is a huge difference in power rating um, from, you know, Ohio State, Clemson, LSU down, I guess, not as big of a jump if it's Georgia, but a much bigger jump for a Baylor, Oklahoma, or Utah. So looking at that, I think the over is the best play. And I also am putting a small star on Virginia plus 28 and a half points and so then i got a call from him saying we don't have to worry about money no more and i said that's good for our next play we are looking at georgia versus lsu lsu is laying seven points over under is 54 now didn't want to go completely into this one with brian on the phone because i know he likes the lsu side a lot he's a gator fan Georgia's probably the biggest rival there, but at the same time, I got to tell you, what I was saying about Georgia, their home field advantage in Atlanta at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium is is real, okay? Georgia's number four in my power ratings. Why is that? Because they should be. You know, they had one hiccup, and that happens all the time. You know, you saw Ohio State have a hiccup when they won the national championship against Virginia Tech. It just, it happens. And I'm not going to hold it that much against Georgia when their defense is playing as well as it has, you know. Sure, they haven't played Alabama or LSU this year, but at least they beat Florida in the state of Florida. They beat Notre Dame at home. And then they, uh, at, at Auburn, and this Auburn team just beat Alabama, so you know that win was pretty good. And that game doesn't really tell you the true story. They were up 21 to zip for a long time and let Auburn score 14 points late. LSU is a great team. Joe Burrow deserves a Heisman. But Georgia, they're the ones with the experience being here. And Jake Fromm has probably heard a hell of a lot about how good Joe Burrow is. And this is his opportunity to have a great game. Georgia has a better defense than LSU. Georgia only allows 4.1 yards per play and 10.4 points per game. 
while LSU allows 5.1 yards per play and 22 points per game. And yeah, LSU played Bama, but it's not like Georgia's schedule was all that easy either. You know, so I don't like the defenses that LSU played. Texas, terrible defense. They only won by seven points. The best defense they played was Auburn, and they only hung 23 points against them. LSU has a .6 net yards per play advantage due to their offense averaging 1.6 yards per play more than Georgia, but that has to do with the fact that they play at, at a higher pace as well. See, their pace of play is making them run up the score a little bit on some of these teams. Ed Orgeron has done a great job this year. And just like Brian said, the coordinators have done a great job. No doubt in my mind, Joe Brady is going to be a head coach soon. Uh, Dave Aranda came from Wisconsin. They LSU stole him from us, paying him over a million bucks to be an assistant coach. I know all about that. Great coordinator there. But at the same time, they haven't really been on this stage Kirby Smart has. He's got the experience. Georgia's desperate in this situation. I like to bet on desperate teams. I think they can get the win here. And uh, LSU can afford to lose this one because they are in either way, in my opinion. I got to take Georgia plus the seven points. This is a three-star premium play and probably a little bit of a sprinkle. I'm to move into our NFL Week 14 free plays. We're going to start with one we brought up already, Baltimore versus Buffalo. Buffalo's plus six, over-unders 43.5. Baltimore, what can you say? Beating the Patriots, beating the Niners. Played some gr- great ball lately and beat some big teams. They beat the Seahawks this year. They deserve to be number one, in my opinion, right now in all NFL power ratings, but... Is Buffalo really that bad to warrant a nine-point difference in the power ratings being favored by six at home? Everyone called them fake news last week, and they went ahead and kicked the crap out of the Cowboys at AT AT&T Stadium under the spotlight. So my power ratings have this, like I said, three and a half points. Okay, You're paying a premium for Lamar Jackson, and saying that, this total... I think it's a little bit low here. Buffalo has played the easiest schedule in the league, and I don't believe that they're allowing 16 points per game and 5.1 yards per play. It's quite correct if you want to look at their strength of schedule. Rank 32nd in strength of schedule, you're going to have to bump that up a little bit. They're going to allow probably more like 20 points to the average team and maybe 5.5 yards per play. Okay, so this total, like I was saying, is very low for a Lamar Jackson-led team. They average 6.4 yards per play and 33 points per game. So they're going to score no matter what. The Bills, they have their own quarterback that can run a little bit, right? Josh Allen, you know, as a matter of fact, that's how they won a lot of their games last year and some of them this year, you know, his legs. But he's actually been throwing a lot more accurate lately, as you saw against the Cowboys. Cole Beasley's been a beast over there, kind of his escape route. John Brown has been uh, all that he's been throughout his whole career, which is clutch, okay? You know, so the Bills are a great running team with Devin Singletary and Frank Gore. You know, the Ravens, D, people talk about how good it is, but looking on paper, it doesn't really show that good. They give up 5.8 yards per play, literally 5.8. And 230 passing yards per game. Part of the reason that Baltimore blows teams out um, is because they actually do play at a high pace. uh, Probably the highest pace in the NFL. The Bills play at an above average play. So I see some points here. I'm going to wait on the number and the side. I'm going to wait till the public gets involved. I believe this is going to go to seven. Could even go past seven. So right now, in the meantime, I'm going to take the over. Baltimore versus Buffalo, over 43 points, and uh, premium shared about a two-star play. And I did check the weather. It's going to be windy, but around 40-some degrees in Buffalo. Come on, don't bullshit me. All right. Pittsburgh versus Arizona. Arizona is getting about two and a half points at home, over under 43 and a half again. So the Cardinals got their asses kicked the last week, right? 
versus a very pissed off Rams team. And I think it really affected the perception of this team. As a matter of fact, the Cardinals about a month and a half ago were on the up and up. All right. Look at how their last five games went for them. Look at who they played. They played the Saints, the 49ers twice at Tampa Bay, and then just played a pissed off Rams team. Okay. Hardest stretch in football, if you ask me. The hardest stretch. Now they have to regroup a little and play a middle-of-the-road Steelers team who hasn't had any consistency at quarterback. The Steelers are a different team on the road rather than at home. They are actually a net negative one yard per play on the road, similar to the, like I talked about, the Green Bay Packers a couple weeks back. And they only average 4.7 yards per play um, on the road. The Cardinals average 5.4 yards per play at home. And even though they give up a league worst 6.7, I have to think they're going to step their game up a little bit after this embarrassing loss and uh, lackluster defensive effort. Steelers have been winning some really close games against some bad competition like Cincinnati. You know, you can say what you want about Cleveland. They split that one. But uh, Arizona's weakness is against the pass more than the run. And I'm not sure that Juju Smith-Schuster is going to be healthy for this game. Okay? James Washington is young yet. And, you know, they just don't have a lot. A lot of firepower there. So, Johnson, I have to think that the Cardinals are definitely going to score no matter what. They will pro- they usually give up a lot of points, but to a, a bad offense like the Steelers, I think they can win this game outright. The Steelers haven't faced an elusive quarterback since week two at home versus Russell Wilson, and that was with Big Ben at the helm. So they lost that game. I like the Cardinals. I think they can win it outright. I'm going to take them plus two and a half, two-star premium share play. For our last game, we're going to go to Carolina versus Atlanta. Atlanta is minus three over under is 47 and a half. Bad defense versus bad defense, really, in, in, a, in a dome. You know, what's that mean? It means the over. Sign me up. The teams both give up six yards per play, 27 points per game, like I spoke to Brian about. And, you know, they're both kind of average on offense, really. But they can get the job done. You've seen them both put up a lot of points. You know, the Panthers, they fired Coach Rivera. This is usually a spot where the team kind of rallies and wins the next game. They are kind of protecting their jobs a little bit at the same time, you know, showing that they aren't that bad and the coach did a good job throughout the year. You know, the problem is will they be able to stop Atlanta on defense, you know, when I'm looking to cap this game. I wanted to, I was leaning Carolina, but I mean they're def- they're so bad on the line. You wonder if uh you know, Atlanta is going to run Devontae Freeman. He was one of my uh, big picks and my nasty sleeper of the week for fantasy football. So uh, I can see them running it up and down in Atlanta and scoring some serious points there. But I can also see Kyle Allen playing a pretty good game. Okay. I can see that this is a rivalry. It looks like Julio should be back. I think he's going to be coming back. He's already practicing. So I really like the over in this game. Carolina versus Atlanta. We're going to take over 47 points. Yeah! Well, hopefully you got those plays and get them locked in for this huge weekend of football. But now it is time for the sharp side of the force. Sharp Side of the Force is brought to you by uwager.lv for a 50% bonus. Please visit uwager and use the promo code odds, breakers, terms, and conditions apply. All right, we are going to start with college football sides here. And obviously, not too many games. And there is nothing at 20% in these championship games but one game is a couple are sticking out a little bit uh louisiana lafayette there's a little bit of sharp money on it's up to 16 percent difference between percent of bets and percent of money 45 percent of the bets are on lafayette but 61 percent of the money so that is a sharp side uh as far as uh florida atlantic there's a little bit of dual action 74 percent of the bets run Florida Atlantic and 79% of the money. I went not significant enough for me 
during the regular season to mention that, but it's something there. And there's a little bit more sharp money on Hawaii around the plus 14 area, 11% difference. And dual action on Ohio State, 79% of the tickets are on Ohio State and 90% of the money is on Ohio State here. So let's move into the totals and... We are starting with, here's another one where, you know, nothing really hit up to 30%, but the under's big in the Georgia versus LSU game. Under 55 and a half down to 55, a 27% difference between ticket count and money. That's a dangerous one, betting unders in any LSU game, in my opinion. A little bit of sharp money. Actually, no, sorry. Here's a lot of sharp money on the Florida Atlantic under. It's a 45% difference, under 50, down to under 49.5. 51% of the tickets are on the under, but 96% of the money is on the under. Some dual action on the Baylor versus Oklahoma over. It's up to 64 now from 61. 72% of the tickets are on the over, but 93% of the money is on the over. And... And a little dual action, too, on uh, or, or Utah versus Oregon under from 51, but it's all the way down to 46 now. Little value left, maybe 60% of the tickets are on the under, but 80% of the money. So there you are for college football sharp totals. And we'll go into the NFL with sharp sides. The Redskins down from 14 and a half, plus 14 and a half, down to plus 13 at the Packers. A 24% difference between percentage of bets and percent of the money. The Falcons, minus one to minus three, taking sharp money. A 26% difference between bets and money. The Lions, plus 14 down to plus 13. uh, 27% between tickets and money. And the Jets hosting the Dolphins. At minus five and a half, a 35% difference between percentage of tickets and the money. So I think that's about it for the NFL there. A little sharp money on the Raiders and a little bit on the Steelers there, but I do disagree with that. Let's look at the totals market. Sharp money on the under Redskins at Packers. From 42 down to 41 and a half, a 45% difference there. Pretty big. Sharp money on the under in the Bengals versus Browns game from 43 down to 41, a 34% difference there. Really hitting those uh, teams playing bad teams there, right? And that's about it for the sharp totals. Yeah, that's about everything that we have for you today. So if you have any questions about any sharp sides, please feel free to tweet us at the Odds Breakers. If you like the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play or wherever you get the podcast. Have a fantastic rest of the week, and remember to go get some winners.